and welcome to Verso Live, a new virtual event programme to celebrate 50 years of Verso Books. All events are streamed live and will be available to watch again after the event has finished via our YouTube channel. Questions and comments can be made via the YouTube chat box. We hope you enjoy the event. Um, hello everyone, this is Lale Khalili and I'm a Professor of International Politics at Queen Mary and I have recently published a book, Sinews of War and Trade with Verso. This is the first in the Verso Live series uh, and the title of our event today, uh, which I'm, uh, uh, it's a conversation with uh, Roland Atkinson, uh, the title of the event is Global Flows, People and Capital. Uh, and I'll now hand over to Roland to introduce himself. Hello everybody, I'm Roland Atkinson. I'm Chair in Inclusive Societies at the University of Sheffield. Uh, I'm here in relation to my new book, uh, Alpha Cities, How the Super Rich Captured London. Uh, I have long-standing interest in the city, in processes of gentrification, uh, gating and urban fortification and, and segregation more broadly. I'm particularly interested in the relationship between the rich and excluded groups in the city. So back over to you, Lale. Uh, thank you, Roland. So what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be essentially having a conversation about our two books, the way they intersect. Uh, and the, uh, and we're going to essentially talk about the mutual questions that we've had for each other, the things that we've liked about one another's books. Um, and then uh, hopefully if there's time at the end, we'll have some uh, a, a small period for uh, audience participation um, and your questions that you can type in to the YouTube comment box, which hopefully we'll be able to answer. Um, so to start with, um, I'm going to go on ahead and uh, just talk a little bit about what I really liked about Alpha City um, and uh, then hand over to Roland and then we're going to go on ahead and just run the conversation in or in an organic way from there on. Um, when I was told that I was going to be talking about Alpha City uh, or talking to the author of Alpha City, um, I was quite excited because uh, the, the subject of the book seemed really interesting to me. I'm a, uh, I, I love living in cities. I've lived in large cities all my life and I uh, and in particular I've lived in London for nearly 15 years now and um, and I go on urban walks around the city quite a bit and love to be able to sort of recognize the changes to the neighborhoods and the transformations that are taking place there. And I live in East London, uh, East Northeast London. And so it was fascinating for me to read Roland's book, which primarily takes place um, in terms of the, in, uh, the transformations and landscapes that it's talking about and the politics that it's talking about and the urban uh, landscapes that it's talking about it primarily takes place in uh, West London. And what what Roland's book uh, is doing, which he'll talk about a little bit of, uh, more himself, uh, is actually to sort of sketch out the ways in which the massive injection of capital, often from overseas, uh, into the various uh, it, real estate projects in, in this city are transforming not only the shape of the city in the neighborhoods in which uh, people are putting money down and buying sort of super Mac mansions and uh, instituting all sorts of changes to the to the living environment but also spillovers elsewhere and transformations in other spheres um, and so it's a, it's a really fascinating book about the ways in which the life of the super rich uh, actually ends up uh, rippling through uh, from their enclaves, often quite closed, often quite securitized, often quite gated, uh, rippling through the life of the city elsewhere. Um, now, this was fascinating to me because I think I'm interested in the way that these transformations in uh, the sort of the social relations and urban uh, environments happen in other contexts, but it was great to read about it um, in the context of the city in which I live. Um, and I I uh, adore actually. So um, uh, Roland, your book was very appealing to me uh, on, a, on a very intimate and personal level. Um, in fact, one of the things that I want to do once I can take the overground further to West London or uh, take the tube over to West London is to take your book along and go and visit some of those neighborhoods on a walking tour and sort of see the ways in which you map that part of London. Over to you. Great, thank you, Lale. That's uh, some very kind uh, words about the book. Um, yes, so um, Sinews of War and Trade, um, fantastic, broad, sweeping narrative um, that really takes in um, not just a, a, an enormous 
uh, region and the significance of that in historical and contemporary terms, but really takes um, a very broad view on the massive changes going back, particularly to sort of the colonial um, sort of takeover of that region. Um, this is a massively engaging uh, treatment of a whole wide variety of changes in terms of the infrastructure in the ports, um, the laying down of, um, <coughs> excuse me, hard infrastructures in, in terms of cables, um, but also the most, the more obvious one in terms of the flows of oil, of tankers. And there's this really strong sense of how over time the region has seen successive winners and losers. So uh, ports coming and going depending on uh, what trade was in place, who was in power, who had sufficiently accommodated gouged out, dredged, and produced these uh, sort of mega infrastructural environments to accommodate um, the changing ship shipping flows in, in the area. Um, I really like the way that the, the, the book is set up in terms of a personal journey and actually traveling through this space and the, the incredibly strong familiarity that there is with uh, the widespread locations uh, across the Gulf. Um, this is also a story um, it has to be said of uh, significant violence, uh, not just in terms of colonial violence, in terms of uh, quite direct uh, forms of rule and military power, but also the violence of money, um, the violence in symbolic terms, in terms of the way that uh, the, many of these new environments are set up to um, accommodate capital and accommodate investment, but the, the hinterlands, this, uh, which are often either highly securitized in relation to the particular ports uh, or more broadly sort of conceal this uh, sort of shadow population that's quite often not benefiting from or in, indeed disbenefiting uh, from many of these uh, uh, changes. So this is a really um, powerful visceral sort of treatment of what's gone on uh, in, that, in that region. It's highly readable, uh, highly accessible and in, in many places it's actually very exciting and maybe we'll come to some of those uh, um, sort of anecdotes and so on a bit later in, in our discussion. I think the other thing that's going to be really important to the discussion tonight is that the really strong sense of overlap uh, thematically um, between, you know, a, a region and a place like London, which might seem so different and so far apart from the Gulf, but actually historically is seeing these waves of blowback in terms of capital moving out of that region, exiting and finding places of investment in cities like London and elsewhere around the globe. So I think this is a, a really uh, fantastic treatment. It's um, probably an, an immensely important book in terms of really setting out a really uh, uh, important agenda of relating these different factors, these historical geographical transitions, and really an incredible insight that I learned. I felt like I learned an awful lot about the way that the shipping uh, operates, the, the the tonnage that can go into particular ports, uh, who can and cannot access. Uh, certain spaces. And so in all of those kind of respects, oh, this is a really uh, exciting, important book. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Roland. It's, it's an incredibly generous reading, but it also, hopefully it's becoming clear to the people who are watching this video what the overlap seem to be, even though we're working at the opposite ends of the spectrum of capital. If I'm writing, for example, about the, the production and trade of goods um, and their movement in places that are often invisibilized, what you're writing about is how the capital that is often accumulated in those settings and through these processes of trade and production end up actually transforming the urban landscape, sometimes miles away, sometimes thousands of miles away. Um, also, the, uh, the ideas of uh, violence, the inter intersection uh, of, of the lives of, of the extremely powerful uh, and those that are made invisible. And again, as I said, the, it, the securitization um, is, uh, is another point of convergence. When we had met beforehand to talk about how we were going to be arranging this discussion, there was quite a lot actually that we seem to have in common, certainly a kind of a positionality towards the ways in which these uh, massive processes of capital accumulation and consumption actually um, 
intensely uh, intensify uh, inequalities. Um, and so I think that uh, it's really important for me also to say, uh, since I didn't say this, that your book is also incredibly easy to read and it's quite gripping. Uh, and it's not just about, that, not just the fact of the yachts and the helipads and, and the Lamborghinis and, and the sort of the mega houses that makes it fascinating to, to read, but also the incredibly clear uh, theorization you do around this without necessarily wearing your theory on your sleeve. Anyway, so what we're going to do today is we're, we're going to have a series of themes and subjects we can each talk about, which will allow us to sort of um, highlight what is common between our works, where the convergences are, and also the differences in the subjects of our discussion. And I want to start with uh, something that is obviously central to my work, but, um, but I would like to hear more about um, how your work addresses it. Circulation um, of people, but especially of capital and of goods, is something that plays a very central role in both of the books, uh, in the sense that in, in your book in particular, Capital, uh, both legitimate and what has been uh, deemed criminal or been uh, set outside of, or it's been made invisible, in fact, um, ends up becoming really important to the shaping of the urban environment uh, in London. Um, and, and of course, this is really uh, at the nub of your book, is, is how this amount, it is this sort of massive injection of capital into West London, into London in, in general, is transforming uh, the city. Can you talk a little bit about one of some, what some of the key conduits are for this uh, movement of capital and bodies into London, please? Yeah, so I think there's there's a whole wide range of uh, ways in which to sort of um, respond to, to that. I mean, the most obvious and more prosaic way is just literally the physical movement of bodies and um, the, the movement of the super rich into the city, for example, via the uh, system of private airports uh, in, the, in London. So we know actually that, of course, a lot of the first class travel goes in, in and out of airports like uh, Heathrow, but the bulk of um, the bulk of movement is actually in relation to the private airports, um, of which there are five. And um, Farnborough takes the lion's share <coughs> in terms of numbers there. Uh, but in total, every year we're talking about 50,000 or so uh, private jet flights, which of course raises a whole kind of politics around uh, uh, mobility, who's moving. We know that a lot of those people continue to move, for example, after the, uh, the COVID lockdown in the city. But more generally, of course, um, we're talking about the mobility of capital, money in motion, money looking for a home or at least a place to uh, invest. And that's, this brings in a whole wide range of sort of subsidiary areas that um, I could probably talk about for far, far too long. But one of those, obviously, is the sense that London is a kind of uh, a port within a, a broader stormy sea, if you like. So. The stability of the city, the sense of probity in terms of uh, legal, um, you know, stability and so on, allow people to feel a sense of confidence in moving uh, money into uh, into that city. So huge amounts, uh, billions flow into uh, the real estate economy. That's become a primary uh, element of the way that uh, the city economy more broadly operates. And I, I want to come back to some of that stuff a bit later on. But um, huge amounts of money is flowing into um, housing as an investment rather than necessarily as a place, um, a place to live. So a lot of the, the, the real sense of the hypermobility is around bodies coming uh, you know, to, and, uh, to and from the city. They're staying in luxury hotels. City has uh, the, the largest number actually of five star hotels uh, of any of the major cities globally. It's got 75. Um, and it has this um, also this very discrete mobility system in terms of the way that people uh, move around using uh, private cars, which um, nothing terribly special about that necessarily, but it's the way that uh, money allows oneself to uh, move around in a very discrete way, moving between uh, spaces of consumption, of leisure, but also residence. So many of the new um, tower blocks, many of the new luxury, super luxury developments in places like Mayfair, for example, um, it is not possible to build that kind of environment without having uh, underground car parking that one can access um, biometrically uh, or using remote access and so on. And so you get this sense of a very sort of submerged uh, 
um, city that sort of overlaid in terms of its mobility, but it's also kind of submerged. You don't tend to sort of see people. It's blacked out cars. It's highly coordinated mobility in terms of somebody emerging from a beauty parlor that, uh, you know, the Mercedes with blacked out windows seamlessly picks them up and, and, and sort of whisks them away. So there's a real sense of the way that the mobility system operates, um, allowing a kind of invisibility of riches uh, uh, within London. And the other thing, just before I hand back to you, uh, Lale, in a, in a second, is the sense of this as being uh, also implicitly um, a slightly rotten um, set of processes in, in terms of the laundering of vast amounts of criminal capital uh, through the city. So our own National Crime Agency estimates that a hundred billion pounds worth of, uh, of, of, of money rolls through uh, the UK annually. Enormous amounts of that are actually flowing through uh, real estate. And we know that um, estate agents are very bad at flagging a lot of that stuff. Um, so in, numerous stories emerge around uh, people turning up with literally suitcases of money, uh, estate agents, lawyers, and so on, potentially turning a blind eye to that. That raises another issue, which is the way in which um, the city has more broadly deregulated or turned a blind eye to many illicit practices in order to encourage these flows of capital as well as bodies, as well as uh, the, the rich themselves. So there's a kind of few things there that some of that we might come back to uh, in a moment, but I wanted Lale to turn back to you and um, to, you know, mobility was something that we both felt obviously very strongly comes out of both treatments. But what did you feel were some of the key drivers of, of, of development and, and the mobility patterns, the sort of networks that we're seeing in the Gulf region and that you're describing in your book? So it's, um, I think one of the things that I wanted to point out was that the Arabian Peninsula had been a very important node in global patterns of trade for actually centuries. So um, we know that there has been enormous amounts of maritime uh, trade that went from the Gulf, but also from other places. But also it's important to remember that the Arabian Peninsula is home of Mecca. So one of the greatest pilgrimage events for the last 1400 years have been taking place um, on, on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and uh, Aden, uh, which was colonized in 1838, was colonized precisely because it was um, an, a very important way station and eventually a coaling station and eventually a bunkering fuel, bu oil fuel bunkering station uh, for the British Empire. So these drivers were all there. Um, and what actually allowed for the construction of such vast infrastructures was the processes of nationalization of oil in the 1960s and 70s. And some of this nationalization, this is, this is not the kind of uh, revolutionary forms of nationalization that took place in Iran, for example, in 1951 and which was rolled back by uh, a coup that was sponsored by the B British and Americans but rather the more technocratic nationalization that happened with the with the states there buying the, the oil companies from European and uh, North American uh, oil companies and nationalizing them essentially turning them into state-owned companies and so once that happened enormous amounts of capital was injected into um, Arabian Peninsula and a lot of of uh, infrastructure was built. And for example, it's really interesting. One of the things that I include in there is um, the roads that were built throughout the Arabian Peninsula and the dramatic increase in the mileage of roads across the peninsula after the 1960s and 70s when the states in that region had control over their own oil money is, is actually striking. And of course, the big maritime infrastructures were part of um, that uh, infrastructure building. But it's also really important to remember that it was wasn't just oil that made this quite a significant uh, location. It um, it has a uh, the Arabian Peninsula has a strategic location. It's near the Suez Canal. It is um, near the Strait of Hormuz. It is near uh, the the Asia and East Africa, and it has long had a kind of a central. Uh, it has long been a central node in the trade between those places, and so the infrastructures, the maritime infrastructures that emerge, service those. And of course, it's really important to remember war making and military um, interests in the making of these infrastructures too, because long before, for example, the US established the Central Command, which was going to be precisely um, 
centered on this part of the Middle East. Uh, the British uh, considered this place uh, their own playground, their own pond in a way. Um, and so the, the strategic element, the strategic military element was also quite significant in this. Um, but there's, of course, the book doesn't just focus on the geopolitical. It doesn't focus on all of those. And what I really also wanted to talk about was the actual people who also built those infrastructures. And it, it has stories not only about, of course, the technocrats and the engineers and the advisors and whatever, but also very importantly, also about the people who literally built this with their own hands and in the process of doing so, or running it with their own hands, and in the process of doing so, have challenged again and again and again uh, the, the power regimes there um, in uh, successive times. So I think that's um, one, of the, one of the things that I really wanted to highlight. Now, um, I also wanted to actually, um, uh, uh, this, this kind of a sense that there, were, that there was a constant ferment of contestation, which resulted in some losses and some wins, uh, was very central to the story I wanted to tell. Um, so not only the fact that Aden, for example, went from being a very central node of trade to being this place that has been devastated by war waged against Yemen by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but also about the internal dynamics where, for example, we see that the nationalizers and the technocrats and the revolutionaries um, often being beaten back with enormous amounts of coercion and yet leaving their mark in particular ways um, on, on the histories um, and, and the physical landscapes um, of, this, of these countries that I'm writing about. So this sense of winners and losers is something that I wanted to mention. And I wanted to actually talk to you a little bit about this win these winners and losers um, in London because of course we see um, that uh London, this kind of a massive sink for a huge amount of capital, um, also produces not just the super rich, but the, the production of the super rich exacerbates the inequalities and the differences. And I wanted you to actually talk a little bit about that, because you do beautifully mention that in the book. In fact, the, the denouement of the book is precisely that discussion, which I found so powerful after we've been reading about the, um, the jets and the yachts and the, and the Mercedes Benzes. So can you tell us a little bit Bit about um, the, the sort of the, the relationship between those who benefit from the fortunes brought to the city and those that don't. Yes, I mean I think it's even worse than that. It's it's, it's even more than the sense of a uh, a curse. There's a, there's actually a relationship here between the apparent success of the city and this sort of compression, this violence that's done to uh, the excluded of the city. So the orthodoxy, of course, at the moment is that. Uh, you know, this is a city that delivers. It delivers in spades. You know, who who would want to refute uh, the sense that uh, you know the billionaires, the ultra high net worths, the wealth creators, uh, the heroes of the peace, as some people in the political firmament would put it, who would want to do, to kind of dispute that? And of course, the book is very much trying to sort of um, dismantle that argument. It's trying to say that actually, precisely because of its alpha position, precisely because uh, is worked so hard to uh, make it this um, this wonderfully easy place to invest in that has had really pernicious impacts on the wider city. Some of that comes through very subtle means. So, not least, the production of this wonderful, um, opulent, luxurious, super luxurious landscape that allows the rich to feel distantiated from the social distress in the city. It allows people to morally disconnect and to invisibilize um, questions of poverty, exclusion, difference in the city more broadly. And this operates not just for the rich themselves, but for many of those in uh, politics, in law, in corporate life, who in the book I call uh, the enablers, a kind of enabling elite that work incredibly hard to make the city work for capital, to work for people who have money, who bring money, apparently bringing investment, but producing not just a, a you know an apparently wonderful uh, more than 500 uh, high-rise towers in the city, but many of that then lying empty. Um, not just um, bringing enormous amounts of cash to invest uh, in various kind of instruments and um, schemes that operate in the city of London, but also bringing uh, laundering, uh, 
you know, kind of questions of, of, of criminality and so on. So we know that in the city, um, there are around 100 billionaires, 5,000 ultra high net worths. So that's people with around uh, uh, 20 million or more in disposable uh, uh, assets. And there are around about 350,000 high net worths. That's people with around, let's say, 700,000 pounds or more, a million dollars worth uh, of assets. So we know that that is actually one of the greatest global concentrations of, of, of the super, super rich in any, in any kind of urban center. It has more ultra high net worths than New York. It has less uh, billionaires. So there's a kind of jockeying as to who really is at the top of the alpha hierarchy. But um, those processes also feed and legitimate processes of disinvestment in, the so, in the, what I call the social city. In other words, those places that are set up and created to accommodate people on no and low incomes. And so a lot of this process has been particularly brought to bear on uh, poorer households in the city who are living in public housing. Uh, work by Loretta Lees and colleagues recently showed that more than, uh, sorry, uh, nearly 200,000 people have been displaced from public housing over the last decade, as many of those uh, estates have been demolished, remodeled, uh, and reworked in ways that were designed to facilitate and help absorb this, these, these enormous flows of, of capital uh, from offshore. So various funds uh, operating in relation to all of those new build uh, schemes. So I kind of riff off the idea from uh, Nicholas Shackson and his colleagues who talk about this idea of the finance curse. And we're all familiar with, uh, um, sorry, the resource curse. Um, so the resource curse would be, you know, for example, some of the countries, in fact, that you're talking about, Lale, uh, where the discovery of oil, far from being an ultimate boon, has been this very socially selective upward uh, flow of capital and resource wealth to the elite, but um, has not benefited other people. People have been disbenefited by that. Shaxon comes along and talks about the finance curse, how there's something intensely problematic about this hoarding of opportunity by finance in the UK through not just the city of London, but through offshore uh, tax havens. So we know, for example, that if you go to the London borough of Westminster, around about one in 10 of every house, is, uh, every house that you would pass in that borough is owned offshore. That raises enormous questions about where the money is coming from and uh, uh, questions of, of, of contribution. So from the finance curse, we can talk about, you know, I, I guess the curse of, of the rich in a city like London. People are talking about exactly the same things, of course, in, in other cities, including Paris, including New York, San Francisco, where this skewing of the economy so far towards those people who are already so extraordinarily advantaged operates not just because they have money, but because that is mediated through a political economy that helps uh, uh, helps that money inveigle its way into uh, uh, the city. The most recent um, example, I guess, that we could point to would be the kind of scandal that's currently operating in the city around uh, the uh, Minister for Housing, uh, who kind of waved through um, a billionaire's uh, uh, development in the, uh, in the east of the city on the river, with little or no uh, provision of, of, of affordable housing. And this is a common story that we see uh, developers constantly challenging the planning system, constantly challenging the need to contribute affordable and social housing. I mean, social housing is kind of just not even on the radar. It's just, that's just complete anathema. So the argument constantly through the planning system uh, in the way that it's manipulated by many developers is to say, look, we can't produce 10%, 15% or, or uh, you know, let alone the 35% target that some people, uh, housing activists talk about. We can't do that. It's too expensive. If we do that, we won't make enough profit. I can take you to, de to develop developments in centre of London. I can think of two off the top of my head where around about a billion pounds of clear profit was made uh, by the developer. So this sense of, of winners and losers is really acute and far from being a kind of... Um, if you'd like a kind of pornography of, of wealth in the way that we often see it relayed through conventional media, it juxtaposes this incredibly luxurious environment and then says, we need to sort of cut into that and then show the harsh reality that sits uh, uh, within the city, but is in many ways so invisible uh, to many people in, in, in the, the sort of political elite. 
So, um, Lali, I'm going to turn back to, to, to you now. And um, I want to come back to this sense of this historically incredibly uh, strong sense of aggressivity, of, of competition between these uh, a, a sort of series of city-states, of micro uh, nations almost vying for control, for, um, you know, to, to, to win in that kind of environment. Can you say a bit more about the nature of that competition and, and kind of where the kind of colonial backstory fits into some of that stuff? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And actually, before I answer that, I just wanted to quickly say, when you were talking about how uh, a lot of these developers actually circumvent the rules about having to build a percentage of social housing, um, places very near to where I live have actually managed to circumvent that by having a very specific zoning uh, in, in East London of having uh, live-work um, uh, buildings within their flat complexes. And, and that allows the developers not to include any social housing at all. Um, and of course, the live work uh, zoning can very easily be changed. And so that is one of the tricks that they do, which I've actually observed just very near to where I am. But going back to the question that you had about the kind of uh, aggression and rivalry and enmity, and I want to actually combine that with a question that one of um, our uh, audience is asking. Patrick Elliott asks, how important is Aden Port um, economically, militarily, and strategically in the region today, and does it play a significant role in Saudi Arabia and UAE's involvement in the Yemeni civil war? Um, and I'll start by saying that the kind of question that you ask is, is brilliant because it allows me to get at the fact that there have been multiple layers of um, contestation, of rivalry, and of aggressive competition. So, of course, there's a long history of anti-colonial struggle, but also the different, the different colonial powers actually um, uh, competing against one another uh, in uh, first trying to uh, secure trade routes, but later once oil is discovered uh, to try to secure uh, access to oil in different places. And so what you find is um, even in places uh, like Aden, as, as uh, far back as the 1850s, you see the French uh, who, who want to use Aden as a kind of a jumping off point uh, into other locations uh, in East Africa, uh, Djibouti is right across the water, for example. And so, um, so, so there's a sense of both intra-imperial struggle but also anti-colonial struggle on the con on, on the peninsula itself then there is uh, competition uh, as the oil companies for example um, arrive um, on the peninsula there's competition between different oil companies and I have a chapter in there where I talk about how um, the oil companies that are, that are prevalent in different states uh, are actually trying to influence the ruling families in those um, states to draw the lines, the maritime borders in different ways in order for them to have access, better access to offshore resources, economic and otherwise, as well as maritime access for loading and unloading um, oil. So, so there is that competition. The corporations are competing against one another and perhaps the most prominent of those um, is the company that eventually becomes BP. Um, it was the Anglo-Iranian oil company which had many subsidiaries along the Gulf. Uh, and uh, the Standard Oil of California's uh, subsidiary there, which was Aramco and which has now been nationalized. And those two companies were enormously engaged in decades of competition and of course collaboration with one another as well. So, so that's also important. I mean, before OPEC came along, uh, these uh, the Seven Sisters had essentially a cartel. Um, so, so that is one level. Of course, the other level that I talk about is the contestation in which the workers engage um, on a variety of levels. And then, of course, there's the geopolitical one, which gets me to Yemen. So um, having access to and control over ports that are located in strategic locations and can act as nodes of trade has been a hallmark of colonialism as far back as um, when the the when the various maritime empires of Europe started sending ships over to the Western Hemisphere. So it is unsurprising that, of course, uh, one of the reasons that is not cited, but anybody in the region will tell you uh, that Saudi Arabia and Yemen want to have either full direct control or at least the friendly government that does what they 
tell it to do uh, is because of where Yemen is located. Now, Aden was, before the war started, not this most important port in Yemen. Hodeida was. Um, Hodeida, which used to be in North Yemen and which is on the Red Sea rather than on the Gulf of Aden. Um, but Aden was really, really important before that and up to about 1970s uh, as, as the fourth largest fueling port um, in the world after New York, London and Liverpool. Uh, I mean, that's that's kind of an astonishing um, little bit of trivia. And, uh, and, and it has always been very important. And one of the things that I write about, one of the stories that I tell in the book is about how the uh, Dubai Ports World, which is a port management company of, as obviously uh, from its name, operating out of Dubai, actually ran the port in Aden and did such a shoddy job of it that the Yemeni government, and they had actually paid bribes to Ali Abdullah Saleh, the previous corrupt head, uh, president of Yemen. Um, and they had done such a shoddy job of it that the, that the government of Yemen um, actually paid them money to leave. Um, and one of the things that has been very interesting is that in the war that the UAE and Saudi Arabia have waged against Yemen, they each have their own local proxies. And the proxies of the UAE are based in Aden, and the UAE itself is also interested in the island of Socotra, which is just across the water from Aden, and which was also a kind of a fantasy destination of the British in the 1830s, because they thought it was a brilliant little island where they could, which they could use as a fueling. It ended up being um, having a, a lot of malaria mosquitoes. Uh, and so in the end, the British didn't colonize it, but it seems like the UAE is very interested in establishing a base there. So there's so there's quite a lot of competition. We can also see a little bit of this competition with the blockade against Qatar and, and uh, by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, and some of the other countries. And what again we see there is that suddenly Qatar now feels that it has to allow for its port to compete against, for example, Jabal Ali, because Jabal Ali used to be the transit port, the primary transit port for Qatar. Now goods are transiting through Oman to Qatar. And so there's there's going to inevitably be a little bit of competition between, for example, Dubai and Oman about this. So, so that kind of an aggressive uh, competition, contestation, enmity happens in lots of different ways and at lots of different scales. Now, this to me is uh, fascinating because it shows the different kinds of um, politics that is happening there. But I also want to actually um, bring up something else that, um, that I think uh, both of our books touch on. Um, when I started, I, I trained as an engineer. And one of the things that I was uh, in my undergraduate, and one of the things that I've always been interested in is the way in which we shape the environment around us. So in order to build a mega port, what you need to do is a lot of dredging and a lot of land reclamation. And so you're actually shaping the environment in ways that are not always very, well, actually, in, they, it almost never is very ecologically sound. It is going to have ripple effects that are enormous. But it also shows a kind of a hubris. It shows a kind of a... Um, a godlike uh, thought about us being able to change everything. And of course, that appears also in your writing about London and in, in the ways in which you describe the Alpha City. So can you tell us a little bit about this kind of dramatic reshaping of the environment that, and, and what it means? Because you did talk about the subterranean city, but I want, uh, and you mentioned also the posh airports, which the jets can fly into. Can you tell us a little bit more about that kind of uh, reshaping terror reforming, if you will, of London. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, each year we get a, a snapshot of what's going on above ground with the, the New London Architecture Reports, which I guess up until now, I think it's likely that uh, the COVID crisis is going to uh, radically rework what's going on. But certainly we've seen, uh, we, well, well right, right now in the pipeline, there's uh, well over 500 uh, uh, skyscrapers um, being constructed in the city. And I think what's really important to remember there is that historically London was this um, rather comfortable, relatively low rise uh, uh, city. Uh, NatWest Tower in the 1980s was one of the really you know, first towers to kind of uh, challenge that sort of position. And we see, of course, uh, in terms of you know, the money almost kind of literally coming out of the ground, um, we see uh, th this uh, rise in high rise to use uh, 
uh, sorry, to signify um, the increasing dominance and expansion of, of, of the city of London. But that kind of story has been increasingly residentialized, if you like. So um, the bulk of what's being built now is actually for residential purposes. Much of it uh, of what I call the riverlands on the waterfront actually is um, designed to kind of capture uh, international mobile capital. Um, much of that is the kind of lights out London scenario. So uh, large swathes of the city um, not occupied for quite large periods of time. Um, that's also a kind of very speculative environment in which I think, you know, many people have uh, bought, um, kind of lost the shirt off their back or, or, or kind of lost money. Uh, it's a very sort of uh, uneven uh, story. Quite often people paying over the odds for a lot of that. Uh, buying off plan in the, the sense that uh, the feeling that perhaps the city is almost a kind of pyramiding scheme that, you know, money just is, is being loaded up into the uh, into the built environment so that massive expansion i think is is one of the key signal changes in the city really and that really um is cemented by uh the arrival of uh the shard the renzo piano piano um you know mega structure uh which you know has a residential component which was revealed to a few years ago to uh, still be largely unsold so there's this sense that there's so much money floating around that the developer doesn't even need to sell uh, units to to kind of remain uh, uh, viable. Uh, that's also, of course, the headquarters of Al Jazeera. This is a story that takes us back uh, to to the Gulf Valley in terms of uh, money, you know, Qatari uh, um, gas money rolling back into the city through Qatari DR, the sovereign wealth fund, being used to bankroll the Candy Brothers production of One Hyde Park. Uh, you know, more or less the only ultra prime uh, development in the city um, not now but then selling you know the most expensive apartment in the city for around about 140 million I think um, just prior to covid we saw a, 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 an enormous uh, house in the West End sold for 200 million this is you know the story right now of course is different and we can come back to this later on in relation to where the city goes uh, uh, goes next but the money, the, the the reforming of the city is quite significant. Now, one of the things that one of the anecdotes that I really like uh, in 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 the book um, is that I that I try and kind of kick off with is um, something that um, somebody who must remain, remain nameless told me about a development in the west end of the city where the um, they put in these incredible uh, marble. Um, floor ceiling sink units with a tap in and beautiful lighting and all the rest of it, pure, uh, you know, solid marble. Now, the owner, when they arrived, decided that this was not uh, what they liked. So, this £30,000 single unit, uh, in order to be removed, it couldn't, it couldn't be removed and simply taken away and reused. It had to literally be smashed out. And I think that's a really uh, wonderful kind of anecdote in terms of. The, this sense of the remaking of the of the of the fabric of the city in line with uh, money, in line with fashion, changing taste that really just doesn't have any sense of value ultimately. It's just simply um, the space is there to be used as a kind of blank canvas. Uh, so we hear stories about entire kitchens, bedrooms, um, entire uh, uh, homes being uh, redecorated with whatever is, uh, is, is the right thing to have uh, this year. And I think this is also a kind of story of boredom as well. I think this is one of, you know, people looking for uh, at least certain individuals, uh, you know, uh, things to do with that kind of space. But the sense of waste is really quite extraordinary. Now, the other side of this is, um, and again, this is uh, echoing, I think, your, your work, Lale, is um, this is you know, it works on both axes. So this is about basements of dredging, of, of digging down, uh, of literally scooping out the soil from underneath uh, and, um, uh, you know, enormous numbers. I think that over, over 3,000 developments, 3,000 homes in central London now have put, been put into our cinemas, uh, servants' quarters uh, uh, and all the rest. So... Um, I could go on, but I, I'm going to pass back to you, Lale, and I think I want to really sort of ask you to sort of reflect, if we have time, uh, on that kind of sense of, 
the remaking, the dredging, uh, the, the the modification of that environment, and what are some of the kind of um, ecological and broader sort of effects of some of those transformations? I think I um, thank you. Um, I think that one of the things that I want to actually do is tie that back also to the changes that are happening now, uh, because I think we've only got a few more fifteen minutes or so more minutes left, um, and then we want to answer some of the questions that people seem to be asking. Um, so, so the environmental transformation um, is something that. Uh, we're not being, I mean, obviously there's ferment around it. We've had the younger people going out and uh, engaging with the question of the Extinction Rebellion. Um, but also we're seeing transformations happening right now, both economically, politically and otherwise, around both the pandemic and Black Lives Matter, um, which I, th and, and of course, in the case of the UK, also Brexit, which I think that are quite significant um, and, and have have important um, effects, certainly here in London. I know that, for example, the activists of Black Lives Matter uh, in this city have been uh, very much engaged in trying to attenuate or at least challenge the effects of, for example, city airport or Heathrow on the populations that are living around there, um, which, which are often racialized. Um, but in addition to that, what we're seeing is that COVID, for example, is showing, uh, it, it, COVID certainly has had massive um, influence, massive effect, however temporary, and I do think it is temporary, um, on global trade. Uh, global trade in March and April uh, dropped by very significant amounts, something, sometimes between 11 and 13%. Uh, some ports have shut down terminals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's true not only in, um, the global south, but also in the global north, uh, we've seen uh, the construction of ports having uh, been uh, having uh, slowed down in many places, and and of course Brexit also has an effect on uh, this trade. and And I'm curious about whether, for example, the oligarchs or the uh, various uh, kleptocratic ruling families of the world, which come and park their money in London, are going to be nervous about doing so post-Brexit. So we, we have a confluence of different events happening right now. Um, I think the climate, the, the, the uh, oncoming climate and environmental disasters one, um, the ways in which COVID uh, is at least temporarily changing the complexion of our cities, but also of global trade, the ways in which Black Lives Matter as, as a movement is at least uh, in, 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 in this country and in the US um, forcing some reckoning with our histories. And then of course the looming Brexit, which will come at the end of this year. Um, and, and I think that all of these will have effects uh, in the Gulf, but more importantly here, and I want to hear what you think about that, and then maybe we can hand over to our questioners um, that, that have had a series of questions uh, written on the side here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and be really brief because I, I know we're running out of time. Um, there's an awful lot to say on this, and um, I think where I would start with is, um, uh, you know, we need the rich. You know, of course, let's let's clap the the wealth generators, and that's the kind of political tone of the discussion that we're seeing from, from the top. And, and, and I guess in, in, I would say that's no surprise. It's no surprise that um, that class of enablers is, is, is trying to establish that kind of narrative. It operates through the main, mainstream media and so on. Um, but this, you know, London is, Lale, you know, it's, it's going to be positioned as a free port it, 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 within a network of free ports, low tax, uh, low tariff spaces that are designed to allow capital to slide into the city. Who knows what's going to happen uh, in terms of, of Brexit, but this narrative that the city is in a fragile moment is absolutely nothing new. So when I started the research um, that underpins much of, of, of the book, uh, you know, nearly 10 years ago, we were in the shadow of the last financial crisis. And the the discussion was we need the developers we need investment capital from abroad because otherwise we simply cannot um get this this housing uh built these new these new developments so actually um we're, we're back you know there's a cycle here and i know we've got to we've got to uh, uh, got to sort of move on but um the other thing that's in, happening in the background is people clamoring to get the report on russian 
uh, Russia's uh, role or influence in uh, British politics to get that report released by the relevant committee. We already have the Russian gold report, the Russian uh, money report, which is absolutely eye-watering sort of reading in terms of influence, money, cri criminal capital and all the rest of it. So this kind of sunrise sunset moment and lots of people sort of saying, um, you know, this is a great opportunity, this sense of crisis and so on, let's mobilize and move towards a future that's more um, progressive, that's less uh, carbon hungry and all the rest of it. I think um, the this sort of retreating tide that's happening during the crisis at the moment is actually going to re-emphasize and re-mobilize the need to business as normal, money rolling in, the city benefiting from that, everybody benefiting from that somehow. Uh, and that not really being exposed to the kind of lie that it ultimately is. So, um, yeah, it, it is a moment. It's an interesting moment and in whether or not we are able to take care of, uh, take advantage of the crisis as they certainly are taking, not letting a good crisis go to waste um, is, is a question that I also have. We've got a series of questions questions, and some of them um, overlap. So we have one question about a kind of a, a, a emerging horizon of change uh, in a post-COVID world and what we think that is going to be. Um, and also one that is somewhat similar to this in the sense of um, what, if anything, is the best way to resist the privatization of cities like London in the form of privately owned public spaces. So one of the questions that I would say about the horizon of change post-COVID is that I want to resist a little bit um, some of the answers that some people are optimistically given, that, that COVID is going to inevitably change everything, that it already has affected, for example, global trade, or it has shut down this, or it has shown um, sh radical inequalities. And, and I actually... Um, one of the depressing things about the world is that, uh, or about capitalism, is that capitalism and capitalist relations and capitalist accu accumulation, forms of capitalist accumulation, are mm -hmm. remarkably uh, elastic and resilient, and they yeah. tend to return. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things that has been interesting um, has been that uh, the, the intense months of COVID in the UK uh, were followed by and overlapped with the Black Lives Matter movement. And what to me that juxtaposition signified, and I think it's one that I wanna push on and what I wanna think about is that we can't hope for a kind of a mechanistic change that's going to happen because an event happened, a catastrophic, cataclysmic event happened. But rather, I think if any change is going to come, it is going to come from forms of mobilization, from pushing back against uh, the, the sets of rapacious relations that characterize and, and exploitative relations that characterize racial capitalism uh, in, in this stage um, of our lives. And whether or not those changes are going to be wide reaching and how wide reaching they're going to be really depends on the extent of mobilization and the ability to reach, to, to expand these forms of mobilization into workplaces, into the streets, into communities. And so I think that those things are really important. And if the state, I, I don't... Um, I don't lament that. I, I don't think that the state has ended its role. I actually do think that the state has always operated alongside capital, and even if uh, it, by absence, even if by um, omission. Uh, and so I, I do think that pushing the state, for example, is enormously, enormously necessary if we're going to see any kind of changes. Roland, would you like to say a word about that? Yeah, um, I have to say that I, I don't really. I'm not really a natural pessimist, but I, I think the sense of the wrong people being in charge at the wrong time um, doesn't really bode uh, bode well. I think there is a hunger in the broader population in this crisis moment for a kind of normality that we know is damaging, and yet we need somehow to deny the consequences of that normal. Um, we're seeing that uh, as, as people are drifting back, the, you know, the pubs that uh, opened and then uh, closed shortly afterwards in relation to COVID. Um, the question of, of where this goes, I think, for the wealthy, you know, are we going to see some enormous uh, migration into rural uh, and semi-rural palaces and uh, offshore islands and so on? Yes, some of that's going on, but it depends on, you know, whether we're talking about the utterly stellar 
uh, billionaire rich or some of the, or those groups who are necessarily still attached to the city. And I th we're seeing some of this kind of working its way out in, in, in quite interesting ways in a kind of um, immunological uh, uh, way in terms of the capacity of those people with sufficient resources to mobilize their social networks in a way that are, um, as it were, sort of extracted from ordinary social relations in the city. You have your entourage, you test your entourage, you have so servants that are known and trusted and who live with you uh, and do not go out of your own kind of, so it's this kind of bubbling idea, but taken to a, a, a particular extreme. I've seen uh, articles in, in, the, uh, in the press around the creation of new housing developments where you have live-in uh, health services, for example, in some of the uh, gated developments uh, in, in the more rural areas attached to the city. Um, so all of that suggests, as I've always argued in my, in my writing, is that money gives people the capacity to exit from the negative externalities of a system that is damaging uh, everybody else. And that's a kind of spatial and, and, and social set of processes. Um, so somebody was asking about you know, how to resist this. And I think I've got absolutely no easy answers on things like privately owned public space. I think there are fantastic initiatives like uh, just space in London. Um, I think there is increasing mobilization, but their sense of fragmentation, I think, is also quite significant. So there's lots of people um, tweeting, getting involved as housing activists and others. And it's a, it's a very, in some respects, that's quite a fragmented landscape that isn't, it would be incredibly hard to sort of challenge the sort of the, the narrative and, and, and where we're going right now. What I would say is that um, from my experience of talking to quite wealthy people in, in other parts of, uh, of the city in the West, is that many of their housing interests are actually quite strongly aligned with those uh, of, of you know, people working in many of the social movements in the city. In other words, um, they are concerned about where their children are going to live, about the symbolic changes in the city, the sense of alienation that's being uh, created by a lot of the development, the sense of a lack of provision and contribution, whether that be in terms of taxation or planning gain and so on. All of those things are really exercising people who we might imagine and probably are to some extent quite uh, politically um, conservative, but actually share uh, a whole set of uh, issues and grievances with people operating within the uh, on political left, uh, engaged in all these sort of planning disputes and so on. If one could find a mechanism by which that broader sense of grievance, anger and uh, disappointment could be mobilized, then we might be onto something. But I don't really have uh, quick and easy fixes for how we might go about some of that stuff. Um, I wanted to quickly actually add on to that. There's uh, uh, Ms. Nagato has asked whether or not disruption in supply chains um, can actually do some of this. And I think that, it again, it is one of those things that it can make some changes, but I don't necessarily also romanticize this particular disruptions of supply chains because that can also be used in particular ways, not necessarily by those who are, for example, working for Amazon or... Uh, I, I'm, okay, so... Let me step back. Yes, I do think it is important to have these forms of disruption of supply chain. And I think that the more we see of this, for example, of mobilization in Amazon warehouses or seafarers today saying that they want to go on strike uh, because they can't get off the ships. And some of them have been on the ships for 15, 16 months. Uh, maximum contracts supposed to be 11 months. These are all really incredibly important and they could potentially disrupt supply chain in significant ways that affect the supply chain locally. But for these changes to be more significant, again, more alliances are needed with community groups, with activist groups in other locales and with, um, and, and there needs to be an awareness that uh, the, the, the fate, not only of uh, the person who works in these logistical businesses is tied to their work, but also to the people who are, for example, struggling for better housing um, or for people who want uh, more equitable jobs. Uh, and so I think there needs to be more of a sense of interwovenness of all of our fates if those supply chain disruptions are going to have an impact beyond the workplace. So I think that's something that I wanted to mention. I also, one of the other questions that is on the list is something that I really would like to actually ask you about, Roland, but I've got something to say about it too. And that is the question of what uh, about the role of art and culture 
in our respective area of expertise. The art object is a thing to deposit capital in and the market is a hidden space of exchange. So I'm only gonna say I was just before coming on here reading a chapter one of my PhD students, Maya Holterman Entwistle is writing about the art market in the Gulf. Um, and I was just reading about Salvatore Mundi, um, a, uh, a, a kind of a mediocre uh, piece of art which has really dodgy provenance, but everybody bigged it up so that Mohammed bin Salman could buy it as a gift for Mohammed bin Zayed of UAE. And, and it was fascinating to read about how such a mediocre artwork, which is probably not Leonardo da Vinci's, was actually everybody even in the art world, even the experts converged on in order to transform this thing into a commodified, financialized uh, uh, piece of, if you will, artistic real estate. To me, that was fascinating because of course, the art world is like real estate, another place where this uh, money that the kleptocrats have stolen from the from their publics, but also regular accumulation of capital is sunk into. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that too, if you could, Roland, because obviously you actually do talk about that a little bit in your book. And so- yeah, on that. I mean, I'm not such an expert on uh, in, that, in that kind of area really, but um, what I would say is, yes, I think, the, the analogy that I would make is to, to reverse that slightly and to say that, you know, properties have become like artworks, uh, you know, a place to store value when people have such excessive wealth that they're just sort of looking to sort of snap up investments that might seem uh, uh, reasonably sound in some sense. But I think the other thing here is to, to sort of comment on where we're going again with um, the notion of free ports and so on. So um, there are some really fantastic treatments of, uh, what's going on inside those free ports in terms of them being the, essentially the largest private private art galleries where enormous holdings of uh, private artworks are sort of circulating globally, never really kind of touching down. And there's a really interesting question about, um, you know, what, what function that art is playing. Clearly, it's an investment. It's a store of wealth. Um, the one in the, the free port in Geneva, for example, allows people to, um, to cre create a kind of gallery space for themselves to bring their friends and family or other people who might be buying the artwork and to, to kind of show it off, but all albeit within the confines of this heavily securitized compound, which kind of relates again, I guess, to, to, to Lale's book more, more generally. So I think there's something interesting going on there uh, in terms of um, the privatization of culture that operates when so many people globally have so much wealth that they, consume these cultural products and then they are sort of taken off the shelf they're taken out of circulation in a sense the other thing is that the way that um you know for certain uh, people um homes in london just simply aren't big enough you know so that some of the construction techniques uh, <laughs> the making of space is, is operated in ways that allow much um larger modern artworks for example to be displayed within a within a residential environment so there's various things kind of going on there but um I, I'm not quite up to speed on the art, on the art stuff. Um, I actually just recently, just actually in the last three weeks, uh, Christie's has auctioned off um, some Benin golds, which uh, a lot of Black Lives Matter activists were gold statues were, were extremely angry about because obviously it's gone into some private collection, and this is of course the looted heritage of people of Benin. But only last week, a priceless uh, blue Quran manuscript was, which had a price of like 500,000 put on it, actually went for 7 million. Um, and we don't know who bought it. And to me, that was actually also something um, obscene uh, that, that I think goes along with this incredible moment where the heritage uh, of the people of what is today the global south is being sold auctioned off on markets uh, and rich people from anywhere are buying it and storing it in these as you say private securitized galleries and free ports elsewhere um i think we have come to the end of uh of of our time um there were a couple of questions specifically addressed to me and i would love to answer those so i would ask the two people that asked the question about quarantina and about Cairo and beirut to write to me because i have a lot to talk about that um, 
Um, and, my, and you can find my email address on, on the Queen Mary website. Um, Roland, it has been um, a pleasure to talk to you, not only today, but in the conversations we've had in the, in the uh, work up to this. You're an incredibly conscientious person, so much preparation. Thank you so much for that. It, it really has been wonderful also to read your book, which I highly recommend. It is lucid and beautiful and easy to read. Also, um, I would like to just at the very end, um, I have been asked to say, and, I, and it is important to say this, that if you'd like more political discussions, please join Novara Media on YouTube at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, 2000, uh, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, 8 p.m. on YouTube, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, check out Novara Media for more political discussions. Um, thank, thank you, you all. Yeah, I should say. Thank you very much for hosting. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Thanks.